The following presentation was recorded at the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2014 for helping make these videos possible. Hello, my name is Tom Calloway. Please note, it is not Leonard Pettering. If you have a beef with Leonard or Kay or any of the other System D people, now is a fantastic time to exit through those doors right there. <laughs> Sit down at your computer and write them the loveliest email you can think of using all of your favorite expletives. I don't care. I don't want to hear it. If you have a beef with one of them, take it up with them. I am not your telephone to communicate beefs through Red Hat, okay? Just out of the way. Who I am is I am in the open source and standards group at Red Hat. I'm in the CTO's office. Uh, my primary job responsibilities are with university outreach, Fedora special projects relating to open hardware and 3D printing, none of which have absolutely anything to do with systemd. However, Jeremy asked me very nicely if I would come out to Southeast Linux Fest 2014 Charlotte and present on the topic of systemd because he could find no other sucker who was willing to do it. <laughs> and I'm a willing sucker, and I can fake my way through most material, and so we will attempt to fake our way through the material. Now, if any of you are like hardcore system D gurus and experts, and you already are like ready with your list of 27 errors in the man page that you want to tear through, this is not going to be the talk for you. I apologize. I will happily try and solve those problems for you later. What I am going to talk about is what is system D? How does it work? and how you use it, which are the three big commands that I think most people want to understand about the new environment. So let's get down to what is systemd. Systemd is a system and session manager for Linux. It is a replacement for the thing that runs with PID1. So the very first process that starts on your running system after the kernel boots in user space is systemd. It is compatible with sysv and LSB style init scripts so if you have one of these things that you've been cargo culting around for the last 20 years and you want to continue using it, systemd will let you do that. It is aggressively paralyzed, and we'll talk about what that means a little bit later. It is capable of activating services from socket requests and from dbus triggers. So that if you want to start something, a service dependent on something else happening in your environment, systemd is able to listen and grab that data and start things dynamically. It's able to start daemons on demand so that when a resource is needed, it runs. When it's not, it doesn't. And it also is able to track processes. Now, how does it do all of those things? So here's the high level details. System D is fast, not because it was written to be fast, but because it was written to be parallel. It wants to start as many services as it can in parallel at the same time. The logic process that goes into the design of systemd states that when you are booting your computer, you are not using your computer. You are waiting for it to finish booting. And thus, utilization of your system is irrelevant in that use case. You are not concerned that your CPU and memory are maxed out. So why not max out your CPU and memory during that process in which services are starting? So that's the model that it uses, is it intentionally tries to run as many things at the same possible time as it can to max out your resources so that you boot cleaner, faster, in parallel. It also starts less. It doesn't start every service that you could possibly ever need later. CUPS is a great example of this. Traditional init models start CUPS as a service as you're booting other things up. But no one is trying to print during boot, I hope. <laughs> you are trying to print later at some point when you have a GUI up and you are open something and you say, OK, I would like to print this document. I would like to print these slides. I would like to print this picture I found on the internet. That's when you want cups to come up. And so what you can set up is systemd will configure cups so that it's waiting for a request to come across, uh, come across the, the printer port. And when it sees that request, it says, hey, cups, you probably should you know, start. Or when a printer, list of printers is queried, it will start CUPS. Now, depending on how your distribution has configured this, CUPS may not be actually operating in that way, but systemd is capable of doing that. Uh, other services you probably don't need to start on, Bluetooth D. I really hope that, that Bluetooth is something you can wait for the GUI to start on before you, uh, before you need to do it. And you can turn on that daemon when you try to make a Bluetooth request. Um, and obviously, uh, the parallelization model is interesting because 
The, the line on the left is how a traditional SysV parallelizes, which is not at all. It says A, and then B, and then C, and then D. And you could have some crude ordering in that based on the num numerical system and that it will iterate through a set of numbers. But to be fair, most of the people I have uh, known that write SysV scripts have no idea what that numbering system is supposed to be, what the ordering means on any of that. They usually end up writing either 0 or 99, depending on what they think it should be. And so that it really doesn't have any sort of logical sense on what the parallelism should be there, at least even the order. And then we look at what SUSE and Ubuntu had traditionally done in this model. Um, this is very much what Upstart does. Upstart says, hey, we're gonna go through all of the things, we're gonna start Dbus. Oh, and then the desktop related things, we'll just start those at the same time. And so all this ended up resulting in was you slowing down your time to log in on the desktop on these platforms. Well, again, what system D does is what's on the right, is it starts everything at once. <laughs> like, there are some things that are done before other things in a dependency chain because they have to be done that way. You do want your disks to be mounted before you start to run things on them. It's a little, you know, so it's not a pure parallelization model like that, but every single thing is starting at the same time that possibly can be done within the reason. And again, they minimize the number of services that have to start first, and those are written in special targets. Now, some more low-level details about system D. Shell is evil. Now, I've written some really disgusting shell in my day, and I'm sure that a lot of you have as well. Shell is fast to hack and slow to run. It's the rule. And the existence of every single shell interpreter that is out there is all to try to speed up shell so that it runs faster. That's why we have bash. That's why we have K shell. That's why we have Z shell. All these things are, they have other features too. I'm not trying to belittle them, but they're all trying to execute shell faster. But shell is really, really slow to run. And it's also pretty nasty to maintain over time because what will happen is that someone will come along and they will say, well, you know, this problem you know, could be solved by adding 13 new functions in here that you know, other things could use, and then you have 13 more problems later. So uh, by moving away from a shell model for everything that you can, you're going to be in a much better place. There's no reason that the thing that controls and monitors and launches processes needs to be based in shell. It's just somebody thought it was clever to do it that way literally 30 years ago, and everybody continued doing it. And also because it gave you the freedom to write some really nasty custom hacks when you didn't understand what was going on. If you pull any sysv init script for anything of consequence, anything more complicated than cups, you will discover just horrifying things inside of there that stuff that has comments that say things like, I don't know why this works, but it does. Uh, you know, timing issues related to, you know, components inside of it, routines that detect which format of config file you are using across the 20 year span of the, the evolution of the daemon. <laughs> and again, all of this is because you are having to write everything to run from the ground up because sysv init is dumb as rocks. It goes, over there some shell scripts, I'm kicking them, they run, I don't know what's happening, but they run. Second thing, PID files. If you've ever done an init script, you probably noted that the first thing I did was I dropped a PID file in to tell, some, to tell things later what I launched as. But very few daemons are nice enough in modern era to simply run on a single PID forever. They go, look, I have children everywhere. I've had babies everywhere. And then you're like, but that was the only PID file I knew about. Why didn't you write the PID file? And the daemon's like, babies. <laughs> so, uh, and again, some of that is because multi-threaded is a good uh, model in modern computing. But when sysv init was built, they said, well, no one will need more than one PID. What are you talking about? This is perfectly acceptable. <laughs> so you had this hack where literally in every single shell script you write for sysv init, you are hacking around the model that you wrote out a file that had a number that had the process that you launched it at, and it may not be running anymore. So when you go to check status on a single PID file with a PID number in there that may not be running, there's a system where hey, I think you're dead. I think the service is dead. And it's not dead. It just spawned off a whole bunch of children that had children that had children that killed their parents, and everything is good, and you're still running. <laughs> but but sysv init knows nothing about this. And so half of sysv init scripts are custom hacks to detect daemon behavior when they spawn children. And to, keep, to try and keep logging. I saw one sysv init script once that had uh, about 3,000 lines of shell code that was doing nothing but trying to detect I notify events from the disk to try to figure out when the, the daemon had spawned more children because it was a proprietary daemon they didn't have the source code for. But it would randomly, depending on the operation of the service, would spawn more children off and then the parent would disappear. And they were trying to determine based on disk operations what the new PID files were so that they could do PID tracking. So that you could run a single command and tell sysv init, are any of these PIDs still alive? Maybe some of them? Is my service still running? 
And that's a really, really functionally broken way to try and track your status of your service. Um, so what System D does for these two problems, I'll spin back, to the shell is evil problem, the core functions of System D are in C. They're compiled C code. They're written to be reasonably clean so that if you look at the shell, you, or the code rather, you can understand why it does the things it does. Um, and again, if you're not comfortable looking at C code and you are comfortable looking at shell, this may not be the best thing for you. But for most people, C is reasonably a universal programming language at this point. There is a general understanding of how C works. This is not going to win any obfuscated C code competitions. It is not intentionally meant to be confusing. It is very straightforward and says, these are the things I do to start, stop, monitor a service. Now for tracking, what system D does, and this is a design decision, is to take advantage of a piece of code called C groups. Now if you were in Andy's talk this morning, very first thing, uh, I apologize again because that was an early talk, he gave an excellent talk from what I hear on C groups and how that actually works in the Linux kernel, all the things you can do with it. I'm not gonna go into any of those details here today. If you want that, you should corner Andy, he have an excellent version of that. But essentially what a C group is, is it is a model that allows you to tell the kernel this process and or set of processes and anything that comes out of it are constrained by the set of limits and controls and monitors that I define for it. So you can basically say, okay, we're gonna run SunMail and we're gonna create a C group for SunMail in the domain that we define and we set the limits, we set the scope of it and we launch. And then the kernel C group will actually tell us anytime that process spawns children, dies off, makes changes, what is it currently running at? What are its utilizations? How many children are there? What are the PID numbers? All of this is being provided by the Linux kernel. So we don't need to do any custom hacking to figure out what's going on with the service. The kernel is telling us based on the C group. So what System D does is it launches every single service that it runs in its own C group. This also allows you to do all sorts of really cool things like limit, pro limit resources per service. So you can say to a service in System D by just amending the service file, say, this is the amount of CPU you can hit at max. This is the amount of CPU memory you can hit at max. This is the amount of disk I.O. you can do at max. You can set these limits and constrain your services without having to write your own custom hacks into the SysV init script to do all these things. It's all built into system D. Now, I want to address this up front because I know this is a common concern about system D. Sometimes system D eats other components. It's kind of like Pac-Man in this way. And that's a Leonard and a K thing, and I'm not even going to start to explain why that's good or bad, and you can take that up with them. But uh, System D did eat UDEV, which was a separate component written by the same people, and they decided that it made sense to live inside of System D. UDEV does device management. It creates all of the slash dev. And if you've been doing Linux as long as I have, you remember before how we used to do this, which was with a giant shell script called make dev. And iterating through that, you know, a thousand times to create the dev structure. Thankfully, we don't have to do that anymore. We have UDEV. It detects dynamic device presence and adding and will create the correct device nodes as needed. Um, sometimes system D replaces components. Uh, there's a journal component inside system D that does event logging. And we'll talk about how that works a little bit later. It has a timers model that does cron-like event scheduling so that you don't have to use cron if you don't want to. You still can, but you don't have to. And then there's login D, which is a console kit replacement. And so if you've ever seen console kit and go, I have no idea why that is there, then login D is here for you. And we'll talk a little bit about what login D is good for later. Now, uh, system D also does have some GNOME integration. So if you're not a GNOME fan, then you probably don't care about any of this. But GNOME leverages system D's capabilities uh, so that the behaviors of system D's operation are better supported inside of GNOME. Um, some of the other distribution, uh, the window managers are working on adding the support for system D. But uh, GNOME actually really doesn't run on any systems anymore on Linux that don't have system D in play. Uh, the folks at, uh, I want to say Arch, tried to pull it out system D out and replace it with something else and they were not successful with modern GNOME. So they and then eventually ended up marking system D as a dependency of GNOME. Uh, some of the applications have hard-coded support for system D. Mutter, for example, is one of the applications. Not a ton of them, but there are some. Now, myths. The myth that system D is only about speed is false. We talked about this earlier. It is fast, but that's a byproduct of the way that it was designed. They think they could make it a lot faster by making the code a lot less readable and disgusting, uh, mm -hmm. and they have opted not to do that. So that if you open the C code for systemd, it's all reasonably understandable and parsable by someone with a low to medium level of programming experience. Systemd is not only for desktops, it is used as the init system for RHEL 7, and you better believe that Red Hat wasn't going to shove that into RHEL 7 if they did not feel that it was gonna be comfortable for server class uh, deployments. 
Uh, SystemD is not portable to other operating systems. That's actually true. It's not a myth. Uh, this is not another intentional design. They felt that it was more important to build something that took advantage of the Linux kernel's capabilities and strengths rather than have something that was broadly portable and just terrible everywhere. So SysV init is functional but terrible everywhere. SystemD is fantastic on Linux. And their cues came directly from Mac OS X on this. Mac OS X does not use SysV init. It uses its own custom init system that takes advantage of the uh, OS X kernel and the functionalities of it. And as a result of it, it boots much, much faster than a traditional model. Yes? Um, I know this is going to be hugely sidetracked, but how does SystemD compare to OpenRC? Um, so OpenRC is more in a traditional system V model. It doesn't parallelize as aggressively. It's sort of in the middle point when we were talking about those parallelization things. Um, it doesn't have the n in instinctual socket awareness that system D does. Uh, it's an interesting deployment. It's not a bad SysV init system. If you're comparing it to other SysV init style systems, system D is not a true SysV init style system. So it's far better and far smarter than system D, but it is still clever hacks on the SysV model. System D is more revolutionary and more compelling in that. If you're benching them for speed, uh, it really depends on your services as to which one's going to come out on top. But in most of the cases, System D is going to outbench it. If you go to the System D website, they have a comparison breakdown on features between it and every single other init model out there. So you can compare it between OpenRC. You can compare it to Upstart. Uh, you can compare it to all of the various other implementations that have been half started and abandoned. Um, but again, the, the big concern about portability is really uh, was a point for Debian when they were having their discussion about which uh, init system they were going to choose. Because Debian has had a history of supporting all sorts of other non-Linux kernels, like the herd and the BSD kernels in their environment. And SystemD doesn't support those, nor has it any plans to anytime soon. So it was one of those design decisions where they said, look, let's be awesome on Linux and let all of the other environments choose their own init system and be awesome in their own space. And that systemd is not intended to be that one init system for all possible platforms because it adds complexity to the code that they don't feel is necessary. The Mac init system is not designed to run anywhere besides the Mac model. So that was a choice. Now, how do I use it? Well, the first step is to pick a Linux distro that already has systemd integrated into it. If your distribution of choice is on this list, then that work has already been done. Debian is in the process of incorporating systemd into their next stable release. You can get Debian builds that have systemd included into it. Uh, Ubuntu has announced that they will support it when Debian does. So that will show up at some point. And there are experimental builds of Ubuntu that have systemd inside of it so that you can test it out and play around. Um, Gentoo is not on this list. Gentoo has some e-build targets that support systemd, but they don't work so well from what I'm told. And they officially have said they don't plan on ever going to systemd. So if Gentoo is your thing, then best of luck to you. Um, but all these other guys have already switched, have already made the switch. Fedora was one of the first ones that made the switch. And we hit a lot of the early bugs in it, and we, like we do. And uh, we got those fixed for the most part. Uh, to the certain extent that now systemd and Fedora 19 and 20 are reasonably rock solid. There's not a lot of bugs inside of the systemd implementation. Now. Adding a new service. Every service needs what's called a unit file. And this is a file that's called foo.service. You want to try and name it after the software implementation that you're using specifically and not the type of service it is. There is a tradition in sysv init script naming to name things, things like mail server, you know, and not send mail. So good name, apache-httpd.service. Bad name, httpd.service. Because systemd is pretty smart in that they, these are designed to all coexist with each other in the same directory. So that if you have 14 different web servers and you want to switch which one you're running depending on your use case, you can do that. So inside of this unit file, we have three different sections. The first is the unit section. And I'm doing a very minimal service to get across the point how simple this is to make. This is a fully functional for a general case service. You start by using your unit bracket. And then you give a description, which is a human readable string, max 80 cares, that describes the service. This is something you will see if you query it and say, what the heck is that thing that's running? And then you have a documentation string. And this is where you specify links to the documentation. And this is a URI, so you can specify in any format. You can point to man pages. You can point to web docs. You can point to all sorts of things. There's a whole long list of you know, standardized ways you can set up a URI. Second section, service. 
This is where you say type, exec start, and exec reload. These are the three minimum things you need for a systemd service. Type is going to be forking for pretty much every Unix style traditional daemon. If you want to do something that's called a one shot, which is where sysv init scripts are especially ugly, where you would run something once and then never do it again, like I know I need to change the permissions on these 22 files every time I boot because they get screwed up and it's just running chmod across all these files. That would be called a one-shot service. It does its thing and it's gone. It doesn't need to persist. Systemd knows it's just running and then when it stops, it makes no attempt to recover, to do anything. It just lets the resources go and closes the C group. So if you have one of those type of services, that's a one-shot. So there's all sorts of, there's like six different types of services, but the rest of them get even more esoteric. So the second you start getting into, well, this isn't working on forking, this isn't working on one shot, what do I do now? That's when you start to get into the excellent documentation that's been written by the systemd folks. They literally have pages and pages and pages and pages of documentation about every single command line option, explaining in absurd levels of detail what it's doing. It's perhaps the most well-documented project I've ever seen. Exec start is where you tell it what to run. This is where you say, when you start, run this command. So you put your daemon, you put your options. That's what I want to run when you start the service. Exec reload is what you tell it when you want to uh, basically rehup the config file back through the daemon. So I made a config file change. I want to reload the daemon. What do I need to tell it to do that? And then you have an install section. And the install section only has one required, which is wanted by. And this tells it what level of target this is required for. Now normally there's only two targets that you care about. One is graphical target, which means this is for a desktop case. Systemd will prioritize it and run it accordingly for the desktop case. Or if it's for everything else, you say multi-user target. And this is where we target services that need to be run before you log in. And that's it. That is a whole unit file for a service. You would be hard pressed to find a eight line sysv init script that worked. It's not impossible, but you'd be hard pressed. So I assume the default for stop is shoot Yes. The default for, he says, he said, so you, I assume the default for stop is to shoot it in the head, and that is correct. It is to send the appropriate kill signal to the process in the C group and tell the C group to collapse. There are a lot of other settings and fields for a system to unit file. There's so many settings and fields for a system to unit file that I could give an entirely separate talk just on additional settings and fields in a system to unit file. We're not going to do that. Um, but they're really, really well documented. So the two links that you need to know are those two down here, and I'll put my slides up so you don't have to worry about frantically copying them down. But uh, basically, uh, what they've done is they've documented every single section inside of the what can go into the unit file and it covers every single corner case they were able to identify in every single sysv file that they were ever handed. So they basically said, okay, people have written this 3,000 lines of functions to do this, handle this corner case. How would we incorporate support for that into the native systemd init process so that you can just say, you know, you only need to run in this specific scenario. You need to stop in this specific scenario. You have a config file that's in a weird place. You need to know what the disk operation is. You want to trigger in certain events. You want to track for dbus notifications. All of those things are different options inside of the init. So you will not have to write any new custom functions to add it. Should you find yourself in the incredibly unlikely scenario of needing something in systemd that is not supported that you have working in a sysv init script, the systemd people are generally pretty good about taking the sysv init script and telling you what the matching set of functions are to go back to it. They're pretty interested in getting anything that is missing added. And as far as I know, they haven't had to add any net new functions in a really long time. Now file system placement, uh, traditional uh, init model uses the etcrc.d structure with varying degrees of uh, directories hanging off of that depending on your flavor of Linux. Uh, systemd doesn't use that model, it's aware of it, so if you shove a sysv init script or an lsb file in that hierarchy, it will still run it and try and follow the rules for that old model. Uh, it's not the best way to do systemd, but you can do it that way. So if you're just really in love with your bash script and you want to run it for the rest of time, you can continue to do so by still shoving it in at crc.d and init.d. Um, but lib systemd system, and this is lib, not lib64. This is one of the things they really like. Uh, this is where packages store their unit files. This is where, as the vendor provides you software, whether that's your Linux distribution or Oracle or whomever, uh, this is where they would put their unit files. And this is done because there's a backup directory in Etsy, 
Etsy system, D system, where users can place unit files with the exact same name that will override the system copy. So if you say, look, I know this says it's supposed to be forking and read this config file, but I really don't want to do that, but I want to leave that file intact in case I want to go back to the default behavior, I can override that by creating foo.service with the exact same name in this directory, and systemd will override and run yours and not theirs. Now, the tool that systemd uses to control systemd and its services is a tool called systemctl. In the systemctl, invoked with no options will give you a full report of all the known services that it is aware of. It will tell you whether they're on, they're off, they're, they're short status, is it running, is it dead, is it disabled, what PIDs are running for it. And then you can specify by the unit file name, tell me more about this, start, stop, enable, disable. If you really like the old Red Hat service command, you can continue to use it. It's aliased in this exact same way back to all of system D. So if you want to say service foo start, you can still do that. That still absolutely works for the range of commands and will probably continue to work for the rest of time. Um, it's not actually doing a sysv init model. It's just translating it into these commands. The key difference here to remember when you're using systemctl, if you've used the old service commands and you're used to operating on them, is that you have to pass the full file name into it and not just the service name. So the service command operated on foo, systemctl operates on foo.service. It also swaps the order, so it's systemctl command service name. Now we talked earlier about journaling, and so if you decide that you still want to run your own logger, whatever logger you choose to do logging, you can continue to do so. Systemd will fully support that. But a lot of the distributions that are using the current Systemd have switched over to using Systemd's logging support because Systemd already knows everything that's running and is able to grab everything from the C groups of every process that it's running and shove them all into the log file for you. So there's no need to have a separate logger running. You can let Systemd take care of that for you. The journal CTL command is the way to view those logs. So if you want to do the equivalent of tail-f var log syslog, then just journal ctl-f. And that will give you a flowing log what would normally go into syslog. If you just want to see the newest entries first, because by default journal ctl outputs old to new, then you can reverse that by adding dash reverse. If you just want to see kernel d message entries, you can pass dash k for kernel, and you will just see kernel related entries. If you just want to see the logs for a specific service, you just pass dash u to the, to the unit file, and it will only show you the logs that are related to that service. Yes? Um, it, depending on how, how does that play with remote logging? Uh, so the journal CTL has an advanced configuration that tells it where, where the logs are being kept. So this command you knows, depending on your system configuration, where it's at polling for that, whether it's polling the local system D instance or it's polling a remote logging instance. More advanced remote logging generally still requires you to have some sort of independent logger for that. Um, you want to know more about the many, many, many other options for journal CTL that are not these common use cases? Again, very well documented page. Um, the last thing I don't have a slide on, but I wanted to talk about was the login management. Um, Systemd has base login management to handle the fact that normally you are having to do all sorts of really, really crufty hacks. I don't know if anyone has had the misfortune of having to look at how Linux used to do login management on the console. It was not pretty, and nobody really was very pleased with it. It was one of those things that everyone knew was a massive bug and security hole waiting to happen, but everybody wanted to sort of pencil that over because that code was disgusting. So systemd replaced that with the login management, so it can do the console login for you, the management of that, and it can also do the login pass through to, uh, to your window management system. So you still have a window management login manager, but it's queuing to systemd to tell it when to start and when to run. Now, the nice thing about having this login management is that it also ate at the same time all of the code that does the ACP ID stuff. So if you remember how a few years ago having to set up ACP I tweaks and you know tricks to get your system to suspend in the proper setting to detect lid detect operations, systemd has eaten all of that code inside of itself. So now it's much, much easier. It is literally one plain text config file, setting an option to tell it what you want the behavior to be when a lid operation is detected. So that when I shut my laptop, I can tell it I want it to suspend, I want it to hibernate, I want it to do nothing. These are all options, and I just change that option on that one line and the laptop behaves. Now again, you find some fun hardware where we have no idea what the ACPI event is triggered by or how to detect it in the kernel. That's a problem, but it's not systemd's fault anymore. It's, it's it's all stuff that we fix in the kernel and not in user space. So we're pushing this problem out of a giant user space whitelist and into the Linux kernel. 
So login D handles all of that very cleanly for you. Um, Dbus initiated services, the nice thing about that is, is uh, even KDE and GNOME are all based around the free desktop standard for Dbus at this point. So when an op Dbus basically is a listening bus, and I'm vastly oversimplifying it, and I apologize, but basically what it is is when an event occurs that is sent across the Dbus, then other events can be triggered as a result. So systemd is listening on, and it, systemd actually launches the Dbus and has special knowledge about it, so it's actually a participant on the Dbus. So when it sees Dbus operations, you can write a service that says, when I see this Dbus event, I know I need to do this. And usually it's start, but you have this model where systemd is participating in the Dbus model. So as your window management system is sending out event operations, systemd can be acting accordingly to trigger other events. <coughs> Yeah, KDBus is the is the KDE implementation of Dbus. Oh uh, no, so kernel Dbus is just just a different place where we're living it. Whether it lives in the kernel, or whether it lives in userland, doesn't matter. It's the same bus. It's just how it started. Um, and that, in a nutshell, is how systemd works. I mean, we could go real deep into the nitty gritty about init systems and start having really violent flame wars about the specific design decisions that are made, but. For most people using a service or having to deploy a new service, systemd is going to be a vast improvement on your life. It makes it much easier to set up a new service, much easier to set limits on that service, and much easier to monitor what that service is actually doing and pull the logs for just that service out. And I will take as many questions as I'm capable of at this point. Yes? So, um, when you're saying that, that there's certain applications Sorry. Uh, when you say that there's uh, some programs that are actually coded up to, to leverage system D specifically, can you give an example of what that means beyond, I guess, the login and the ACPI and the DBUS initiation stuff? Like, what sure. does that mean? Sure. So, um, most of the examples today where system D uh, behaviors are coded into an application are understanding that A, systemd is massively parallel, and B, dynamic. So uh, traditionally, for let's say take Avahi, for example. If you were running Avahi um, to, to network detection and behavior, uh, you would have to start Avahi early and always make sure that Avahi was running and run checks to make sure Avahi was running before your uh, user space app was actually using Avahi. Um, some of the Avahi tools in GNOME have stopped doing that, have, have, have ripped out the code to do that detection because they know that systemd is running Avahi dynamically and don't have to check. They just go, okay, systemd's got Avahi, we're just gonna start sending a request across the bus. So uh, that's the cases that are most common for those sorts of scenarios where they're dependent on the behavior of systemd as opposed to systemd itself. So if you had something like OpenRC and you could make those same assumptions about dynamic services, then it would work just as well. It's not linked to systemd libraries or anything like that. Uh, you, go ahead. Okay. Um, I know for um, legacy scripts it's not necessarily recommended, but for launching legacy scripts with systemd, do you just basically use your shell file in your unit for the exec, or is there some other way to use systemd to execute a legacy shell? Like the answer to all good questions, it depends. Now, is your shell script standalone? Does it run without importing, import's not the right word, but you get the idea. Is it pulling functions from other components of sysv in it. If it is, and they're non-standard because you wrote them yourself, you could bring the whole pile of shell along with you and put it inside the RC structure. Systemd retains the standardized sysv functions that are included by the spec standard, so anything that you wrote to the standard is working. But what most people who have these disgusting scripts did was they wrote additional add-on functions or they used Red Hat custom functions or SUSE-specific functions that made it work for their environment. You need to make sure you bring all of that baggage along with you because systemd is not going to magically know what shell functions are not there. So you have to be careful that you bring the whole package. But if you bring everything across, it will work just fine. All right, Kevin, you're up. So you were saying that the at the system level for the uh, suspend and the hibernate things, that's as a text file. But you know, say the system level says do nothing on lid close, but then you log in and there's that GUI option that says I want to suspend on lid close. Is that something it would notify over Dbus? I'm assuming that used to be done like with ACPI stuff. Yeah, it depends on the it depends on the window management and what they were set up for. Uh, GNOME has pulled all that has gutted all that code out, so it doesn't have that option anymore. Like you can't set a G settings anymore to set lid operations. They pulled all of that out. 
Um, and it is all controlled by system D in the GNOME environment. They don't, they don't attempt to do it at all because it was a giant pile of whitelist cases hard-coded into user space software and it was a giant mess. So all of that is now in kernel space. And so all system D does is tell it what operation we want to do when we detect that specific event. On the command line, do you have uh, service name completion? Yeah, it does. Yeah, there's, there's, there's the, the, all the, all the depends, again, depends on your shell, but uh, in bash specifically, it does have service name completion. So if you type foo tab, 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 it will list all the valid services that are in that, the two directories that it knows how to look for. Pass it down. So this is sort of more a comment question, but maybe you can add some more detail. So I found in uh, Fedora land, uh, especially moving older systems to it, the network manager wait online service, which is sort of something you can turn on. It's like the answer to a bunch of things in Bugzilla. Uh, it's kind of a, not in the spirit, but what it does is it just waits until you actually have a functional network connection and then keeps going. And that makes lots of legacy things much more happy. So. That's true, yeah. So if you're, if you're hacking around the old SysV behavior of having your script numbered after the network number, because SysV is very much not parallelized, and you really just want to make sure that your script doesn't even try to start before a network is established, um, then you have to do some sort of a manual wait, like he's talking about, where you wait, you enable the network manager wait service, and you say, nobody else goes until I go. And then you, you force that target in, and you change the order. You slow everything down as a result. But if that's the way your services have to operate, then that's what you can do. Uh, you mentioned uh, that it used C groups, and I was wondering how does it actually leverage that? Are you able to actually set the resources in? Yes. So what you can do on a per service file basis is there's two places you can set it. You can set it system wide and say every time you start a service, this is the resources I want to give it for, for your whole system. You can set a rule for every single service, and then you can override that on a per unit file basis. And you just add lines into the service section where you say max CPU allocation, max disk I.O. allocation, and there's literally 25 different variables you can tweak on that. And you can set those per service so that you can have it so that I say, well, you know, I really just don't want my web server to go and eat all of my traffic in case we get slash dotted, and I really just want to make sure we never go past this line. Yes. So is there still a single user mode, or are these alternative run level concepts that you used to have, or does that still exist or so the, needed? The concept of run levels is gone in system D. It emulates them. So if you go and you look at, uh, if you look in, and you look at the place where you used to set run level, it's now a text file that says, ha ha, there's nothing here for you now. Uh, but it talks, about the, it talks about what the equivalence is. So if you pass S or 1 to, uh, the kernel command line option string, it will still boot you into single user, it will still boot you into an it equals bin bash if you set these sorts of things, if you override PID1. All those behaviors continue to work because system D is just replacing the binary that was at init1, and it does have the proper handling for emulating the run level. The only run levels that it emulates are three and five. It doesn't emulate any of the other run levels because let's be honest, you never used them properly anyways, and nobody else did. Uh, the only ones that ever anyone ever got right in the Linux world were 3 and 5, and those are emulated to graphical at 5 and multi-user at 3, and so those are what it's emulated to. So when it gets to multi-user, it stops, instantiates login D, pulls up the console login. If you set to graphical or 5, it runs all the way through and launches the graphical login manager for login D. Uh, building up on that, uh, where is this uh, file where you can just say, um, just uh, list um, if, if I type in three at the command prompt, start multi-user, because I've noticed, for example, that if you do this in Fedora, right out of the box, it will work, but if you do the same in Arch, Arch will just laugh at you and start the graphical login anyway. Um, so I don't know the answer for Arch off the top of my head. Uh, traditionally, if you want to do this as a one-time op, you stop it at the bootloader and you override the, the string at the bootloader, and no matter what you've written to your file, you've already passed that to the kernel, and that's magic. If for Arch, I think you would have to figure out what is getting passed to the kernel to get your magic, which file is actually being read in by the bootloader, and that's gonna depend on how your bootloader is set up on Arch, and I don't have the answer to that. So that's even at a higher level than systemd. It's not, that's happening well before that. Now one thing that's worth mentioning here that you're gonna come across is the lack of a, RC, of a rc.local file. 
uh, which was sort of the catch-all of, I just need to run this one thing on this system when I boot. That file's gone. System D has no comprehension of RC local. If you throw an RC local file in there, it won't do anything with it. You need to write a service for that thing. And you're probably writing a one-shot service for it, and that's what they want you to do, and that's why they have no intention of supporting RC local. They think that RC local is a war crime, and they don't want to support that anymore. <laughs> so so, this, so that, that will be probably the first thing you do, is you will instinctively go to write your rc.local and just add that one file, and we'll be frustrated as to know why that didn't work, and that will be the first time you write your first one-shot service. But you can write a one-shot service to source RC local. You can, and there's, and there's actually a lot of people that have done that, that have, that have written, <laughs> written one-shot services that read in and execute RC local. So, I believe I believe uh, I believe Arch actually includes that by default. So they hack in support for RC local into system D in the Arch environment. So the other thing I just heard about for the first time in this was the um, the cron replacement. Is that um, uh, how, how good is that? Can we just forget about cron altogether and just use this now? Or again, I'm if you are a power user of cron, no. If you were just turning on a service when a time event hits, absolutely. You just write a timer file out. And again, the timer file is documented. You include it along with the service. It's the same name as the service, except it's dot timer. And then you tell it in these time conditions and this cron syntax, launch. And it goes and it does the same thing. It inherited the same syntactical model from a basic cron file. You just don't have to put it in cron.d anymore. It's just systemd saying, hey, when this timer event occurs, then we launch. So it's not per user cron jobs? No, no, it's not. It's per service. Um, can I trigger Apache to start when it gets a network connection on port 80? Yes. And can I shut it down automatically after a certain length of time when no activity has been happening? Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, anything that is socket-based behavior or traffic-based behavior or disk-based behavior, you can set the rules either in the C group or for the socket. You specify the socket file that you're tracking. It gets more complicated in writing the script, but it is documented. There are examples on how to do it. Looking at your Linux distribution for things that are already configured to be socket activated are going to be a great first start to figuring out what you want to put in there. So INET-D is finally dead? INET-D is finally dead. All right, I think that's it. Thank you guys very much for your time and uh, attention. Customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.